Hello, hi. Welcome to this recording of the lecture on commercial law on the law of agency. And today we want to look at the controversial case of Vatil and Fenwick, a case which is highly examinable, a case which has been criticized, a case which has been doubted, but yet one for which the still applies in UK as good law. And so we want to examine this case critically to see what is so controversial about the case and what is the current status for this case. We begin by examining the facts of this case of a Tuan Fenwick, where in this case it concerned an owner of a hotel who had sold off his hotel to another party, but yet he still maintained himself as the licensee and he was permitted to put his name still over the door of the hotel and he was employed in fact as the manager for the hotel by the new owners. However, the new owners had restricted him in forbidding him to buy any goods on credit. In fact, he could not buy anything apart from just water and ale. However, against those instructions, in breach of the authority placed on him, this agent went on to buy cigars and on credit. And so when the sellers wanted to sue for the payment, the hotel now claimed that the agent, the manager, had acted outside authority in breach of instructions and they refused to pay the sellers for the goods supplied. And so now the hotel is being sued and they are asked to be responsible or to be liable for the acts of their agent. And here, in a very controversial decision, the court held that the hotel, the principal, should be liable for the actions of the manager, the agent, because he had acted within his usual authority of a hotel manager. Now one would wonder, why is this case controversial? Because if this was a conduct by the manager, which is usual in his position to order goods, cigars, on credit, which was usual for someone like him in his position during those days, to order cigars on credit, then in that sense it is only correct for the principal to be responsible for the actions of his employee, his agent, because he had behaved in his usual authority. And so we now want to look at the case in more detail to understand what is so controversial about the case. What are some of the criticisms of the case of Tian Fanwick? And the main objection seemed to be that in the case of Atiu, that there was no sound legal basis for the agency. So for example, we want to start off with implied usual authority to ask how come we cannot imply that the hotel manager would have the authority to bind the principal if he was acting within his usual authority. This would be an argument drawn from the other cases such as the case of Harry Hutchinson, where in this case, the court recognized the doctrine of implied authority associated with someone's position. In that case of Halley Hutchinson, it was a company director, and the court said that being such, you would have certain usual authority to behave and to enter into contracts and to bind the principal of the company. However, the case of Halley Hutchinson is different from our present facts, where in the case of Halley Hutchinson, there was no restriction on the authority of the director. And that was why we allowed or recognized for him to have implied authority. Whereas on the facts of Atui and Fenwick, very clearly, as noted earlier on on the facts, that the particular hotel manager had been clearly told not to buy goods on credit, yet against those express instructions, he had gone ahead. The point or the principle is this, that there can be no implied authority where it conflicts with the express instructions of a principle. Simply put, if the principle had said, do not buy goods on credit, surely you cannot be saying that it's implied I can buy goods on credit. So therefore, 
The case of a Tian Fan Week does not fit into implied usual authority in a normal sense because there was a clear limitation or restriction on his authority and as such it prevents any implied authority to contradict or to go against the express instructions. Let's now look at another possible ground to allow or create agency and that being apparent authority. Could it be said that the agent being the hotel manager would have the appearance of authority. This again, of course, being an established basis for agency from the cases like Freeman and Lockyer and some other cases, where in that case the court recognized that an agent, if he's placed in a particular position where it appears to a third party that he has authority, therefore the principal who had placed him in that position, who had made such a representation by conduct, would be stopped from denying the agent's actions or contract and would now be bound to a third party. And so similarly, we want to argue that on the facts of a Tuan Fan Week, it was the principal who had employed that manager, it was the principal who had placed him in a position to be able to order goods, and so therefore, there would be perhaps that appearance of authority. But however, again, this is not so on a particular facts, because on the facts of this case of a Tuan Fan Week, the third party never knew that the agent was an agent, and there was no representation whatsoever from the principal to the third party that this was an agent that was acting for him. The point is this, that the third party believed the agent to be the principal. There was no appearance of any agency authority to begin with at all. In order for there to be apparent authority, there must be an appearance of authority, more specifically, an appearance of agency authority to a third party. But yet, the third party never recognized or realized that the manager was an agent. The third party thought that the manager was still the owner and the principal, and had contracted with him on the basis, as if he was the owner. And therefore, that's why the court held that there can be no apparent authority, and therefore that will not allow for any justification for Watu and Fenwick either. Of course, there's one more way in which we can attempt to justify Watu and Fenwick, and they'll be using the doctrine of undisclosed principle. And we know, of course, that based on this doctrine, that it doesn't matter that a third party is not aware of the existence of the principle, by virtue of this doctrine of undisclosed principle in the UK, the acts of the agent will be binding on his undisclosed principle. So can we now argue that this case can be justified based on this doctrine? However, in the case of Siu Yin Kwan and Eastern Insurance, the principle or the requirement is that the agent must have behaved or acted within his actual authority. In other words, for any undisclosed principle to be bound, even though yes, the doctrine exists to bind the principle in such a manner, but that is only provided that the agent had acted within his actual authority. But as we noted earlier on, there was no actual authority for which the agent had acted within. In fact, the agent had gone against, had breached his authority, and accordingly, the doctrine of undisclosed principle will not arise. And so all in all, we now come to a conclusion, having analyzed the three different possible doctrines that could give rise to agency, that neither of this fits into the case of Bertie and Fenwick to justify how the acts of that agent would have been binding on the principal. In fact, because of this, this is a case that has now been overruled in Canada in the case of Sign or Light and Metropolitan Life, where the judges clearly stated that Vatil was a wrong case, there is no legal basis for the case, and therefore is a case of such unanimous, unfavored reputation, a case for which there is no proper legal basis, a case for which is of doubtful origin, it's a case that should be abolished. And so today, Vatil and Fanwick has been abolished or overturned in Canada, and it does not apply. Now, no doubt, this is not binding on the UK, but it is a good case for us to note to criticize the case of Atiu 
and perhaps if a similar case of a till the facts were to arrive or come before the court in UK one more time, there is every possibility that a till may be overruled. But until such time, the case remains good law, and so we want to understand and examine how then is it that the case perhaps can be distinguished, which has been so consistently in the UK, that despite not being overruled, it has been doubted and consistently not applied in the UK. So for example, in the case of Kinehan and Perry, the court distinguished itself from the case of Atiu because on the case of Kinehan, the contract made by the agent was for the benefit of the agent himself. He had benefited and that was not a benefit that went to the principal. And so in that sense, it's not appropriate for us to still hold the principal to be liable. Of course, on the facts of a till, as noted, it was very clearly where the manager, no doubt, had acted out of authority, no usual authority in any sense of the word of it being implied on him, but yet the benefit did go to the hotel. And so on that note, you find that Wati and Femic perhaps can be understandable, might not be legally justifiable, but understandable, because on the facts of a till, the benefit did go to the principal, the goods ordered on credit, the cigars, were for the benefit of the hotel. Another case that we can use to reconcile, or rather to understand what you, would be this case of Dowd and Simmons, where in that case, the third party knew, or ought to have known, of the agent's lack of authority. And so if that was to be the case, now obviously then we should not still give rise to agency. The principal should not be bound because the third party himself on a balance should be not able to enforce the agreement since he was at fault in the sense of him knowing or objectively where he should have known of the agent's lack of authority. Finally, we have a case of British Bank and Sun Life Assurance, a case that makes us question what is the scope of this so-called purported usual authority? And is it true that in that particular profession, in that particular agency appointment, that there is any usual authority in the sense of it being an established, well-defined, customary usual authority of such an agent? Now granted, on the facts of Wattie and Fenwick, an innkeeper, a hotel manager, perhaps can be said to have with it certain well-defined roles and duties, and it could be how the case of a till can be justified. But what about other types of agents? On the facts of British Bank and Sun Life Assurance, this was a insurance manager, a manager of an insurance company, and the court said that there is no universal or usual authority for such managers. And therefore, that's why the usual authority in Wattie and Fenwick would not apply. And I suppose this would be so for a majority of other professions or industries or types of agents where it might not be so easily established that there's any huge authority for the position. Take for example the case of a restaurant manager. So if you are an agent and you are a restaurant manager, would a restaurant manager have any huge authority that's well defined? that's customary, that's universal, that everybody recognizes that to be what a restaurant manager can do? The answer is perhaps not, because obviously in different types of restaurants, in different settings, the duties could be different. So maybe some restaurant managers would hire and fire, some don't. Some perhaps now may be in charge of a payroll, and some don't. And so the point is that this would be a very useful, flexible argument that we can argue on the particular facts of different cases to perhaps show or argue how there may not be any such usual authority within that particular occupation or position of the agent. Therefore, Wattie and Fenwick will not apply. All in all, what I would like you to see is that Wattie and Fenwick is a very narrow case of limited application to be confined to its facts and where possible perhaps to be distinguished. It is clearly a case where the UK judges had not shown too much favour for 
As we can see now in this slide, it has been consistently criticized. Perhaps the only way in which we can justify the case of Bertie and Fenwick is a recognition of how the judges are concerned with wanting to protect the interests of the third party. Again, we want to note that the goods ordered went to the hotel who benefited. And this was really an agent that was acting for the principal, no doubt, not without any authority, but it's something for which a third party would not be aware of. And so on the balance, it may be said that perhaps that the balance fell in favour of protection of a third party, and that is the basis of Bertie and Fenwick, the balance of interest to be struck in protecting the interests of a third party in principle, in this case, on the facts of a and Fenwick, it fell in favour of a third party. And so on a case-to-case -case basis, that I suppose would be how one could argue to see whether would Batu and Fenwick apply on a particular set of facts, depends on whether, based on a factual matrix, based on a fact that you may see in an exam question perhaps, would it be such that the third party is deserving of protection and a balance now whether or not overall should Vertu and Fenwick still apply. So I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture. And if you have, uh, please feel free to subscribe, to share, and to like. Thank you very much.